Second Peter chapter 1, we're going to read two passages um, this morning. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 8. As you're turning there, I just want to say a welcome back to Rosemary Styles. It's good to see you, sister. Glad that uh, you're feeling well enough to come. Amen. Amen. Good. It's good to see you. All right. Did I say Second Peter or First Peter? Second Peter. Good. That's the right one. Second Peter, chapter one, verses three through eight. Peter says, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from becoming ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then turn, if you would, all the way back to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 32, the end of Deuteronomy. In fact, um, just before Moses is uh, going to be called up to the mountain by the Lord, where he is going to be uh, where he is going to die. And as, as you know, God himself um, buries Moses there. These are the last words uh, that <clears throat> Moses says before that event. Chapter 32, verses, uh, beginning in verse 45. And when Moses had finished speaking all these words to all Israel, he said to them, Take to heart all the words by which I am warning you today, that you may command them to your children, that they may be careful to do all the words of this law. For it is no empty word for you, but your very life. And by this word you shall live long in the land that you are going over the Jordan to possess. You may be seated. I've chosen uh, these two passages partly for their content, and of course the passage there in 2 Peter is full of content. There's no way that we can get um, to it all um, in one sermon. But um, not only for their content, but also for the circumstances um, that are similar um, in which both of these passages were written. The words that we read from 2 Peter were written sometime in the early 60s AD, just, um, and uh, um, Peter, as we know, just as Jesus had said, um, Peter had helped to establish uh, the, the early church, and he had become a leader in the early church. And the tradition uh, of the church fathers is that Peter had become uh, the leader of the church in Rome. But now, as Peter is writing these words, he knew that his life was coming to an end. In fact, if you read on to verse 14, Peter says, I know that I will soon put aside this body as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. It had been over 30 years since Peter's brother Andrew had first introduced him to Jesus. And since that time, he had grown from an impulsive and bombastic fisherman into a beloved and faithful leader of the church, who was known and respected for his 
steady temperament and his godly wisdom. And now, according to what Peter says here, Christ had made it clear to him that his life and his ministry were going to be coming to an end. Perhaps even within months of writing this epistle. Um, and as you know, at least the, according to tradition, um, Peter would be crucified under the reign of Emperor Nero and the great persecution that broke out against Christians in Rome. And tradition has it that Peter refused to be crucified right side up because he was not worthy of the same death that his Lord suffered. And so he insisted on being crucified upside down. And these are among the parting words of a seasoned pastor to his congregation. And he says, we didn't read this passage, and as you go on um, in, in chapter 1, he says, I think it is right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of a reminder. I think it's right to remind you of these things. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. It's from that perspective, I think, that we need to read these words in Second Peter. Peter is saying, after all of these years of sharing together as pastor and congregation, this is what I want to leave with you. You have to go on from here without me. And if you're going to be strong and endure the challenges that lie ahead, these are the things that I want you to remember. Whatever else, remember this. Hold on to this. And as I noted, the same can be said of the passage that we read from Deuteronomy. Moses, too, has already been told by God that after 40 years of shepherding the people of Israel, his ministry is coming to an end. And he too is delivering his parting sermon. Immediately after that, as I said, God calls him to go up the mountain. I can't help but uh, because of my generation, but have this image in my mind of Moses standing there looking kind of like Charlton Heston with his uh, standing on a rock, holding forth with his staff, saying to the people, remember these things. His cloak is whipping in the wind and his long gray beard is flipping back and forth. And in those parting hours, he leaves the people of Israel with his final and most important instructions. You must go on from here without me. You've been called by God to be a nation of priests, a holy nation set apart for God. And now you are about to enter the land that the Lord is giving to you. And if you are to prosper there, if you are to endure as God's holy and faithful people, these are the things that you must remember from generation to generation. I haven't started there because this is my final sermon to you. I want to just put that, put put those uh, thoughts to rest. For some of you, that may be a disappointment. I don't know. I started there because it seems to me that these final instructions from these two great leaders of God's people demand special attention. Both of these are pivotal moments in the history of our faith. The people of Israel were preparing to enter the promised land, and Moses would not be going with them. And the early church was in a similar situation. The apostles would soon be gone. Peter's own life would be taken. 
soon. And the early church must figure out how to carry on without the leadership of the apostles. And because of that, you can hear the urgency in both of their voices. Peter says, I will always remind you of these things. As long as I am in the, in the body still, I will remind you because I think it is right to refresh your memory. And Moses says, hear these words and take them to heart. These are not just idle words. These words are your life. And not only are they equally concerned that their final instructions be heard and taken to heart, but I find it interesting that their final instructions are also both concerned with essentially the same thing. And that is that the people who must now go forward into the future without them be firmly established in the truth. And Peter uses that expression a little later in chapter 1, to be firmly established in the truth. Over and over again, Moses implored the people of Israel not to forget the words of the law. He told them that They should know God's word and that it was so important for them to know God's word that God came up with all kinds of ways to remind them of it. And the list seems a little strange to us, but I'm not sure it's the details of the list so much as the importance of filling their lives with God's word. So he said, read it aloud. He told them to write it on their houses and on the gates of their houses. He told them to sew it into their clothes so that they could carry it with them. And he even told them to write it on their foreheads. And of course, the Jewish people have taken all that literally and they do those things. But I think what Moses is really emphasizing here is, this is important. Don't let this out of your field of vision. And throughout the book of Deuteronomy, over and over, he says things like, learn these words, study these words, rehearse these words, remember these words, take these words to heart, obey these words, and teach your children to know these words and obey these words. These are not just idle words. They are your life. The implication essentially is if you, Moses speaking to the people of Israel, if you and the generations that follow you are going to live as God's holy and faithful people, you must be firmly established in the truth. And what Moses unfolds for the people of Israel throughout the book of Deuteronomy, Peter also gives us in a shorter version. As he calls his audience, those that he has shepherded, his congregation, to be firmly established in the truth. He lists a number of qualities And those qualities that he says make every effort to add to your faith can be boiled down really to three components. To right actions, he talks about goodness and self-control. He talks about right information, that they need to have right information, and that's the focus that I'm really zeroing in on today. He talks about knowledge and right attitudes perseverance, and brotherly kindness, and love. It is essential that we make every effort to pursue these things, Peter says, so that we don't become ineffective and unfruitful in our knowledge of Christ. What was true then for the people of Israel back in Moses' day, was also true for the believers in Rome. And it's true 
for us. We have to know the truth if we are ever going to live the truth. Because as we come to know God's word, we come to also understand what it is that God wants us to do. And as we obey him, as we obey his word, his word trains us to think like him and to value what he values and to love what he loves. That's why it was so important to Moses and the people that the people of Israel know the law and that the knowledge of the law be passed on to the succeeding generations. Because if they didn't know him, if they didn't know his word, they couldn't live it. And Peter's concern was the same. He was concerned that the congregation, after he was gone, continued to be effective and fruitful. So Peter says, make every effort to add to your faith. We tend to think of faith as all we need. And in one sense, that is certainly true. We are saved by grace alone through faith alone. But what Peter is talking about here is not Christian salvation, but Christian maturity. Faith is absolutely indispensable, and we cannot enter the kingdom of God without it. But if we are going to live as citizens of the kingdom, we must add to our faith. And the same was true for the people of Israel. In order to get into the land, they had to cross the Jordan River. But crossing the Jordan River was not the end of their task. It was actually just the beginning of their task. Because once they were in the land, it was their responsibility to conquer the land. So they had no business crossing the Jordan unless they were prepared to become warriors and to fight against the giants that lived there. And remember, uh, 40 years before, they had been at a similar moment. They were ready to cross the Jordan. And they all but Joshua and Caleb said, no, we're not going. We're not prepared to be warriors. We don't want to be warriors. We're not ready to face the giants in the land. And we're like them as God's people. Not necessarily in that way, but sometimes we are like them in that way, aren't we? By faith, we have crossed the Jordan. By faith, we have entered in to the fellowship of God's people. But now there are battles to be fought. And if we're going to be effective and productive in our knowledge of Christ, Peter says, we must mature from slaves into warriors, which was what Moses was concerned about. We must make every effort to add to our faith. And for both of those great men, among their chief concerns is that the people of God know the word of God. These words are your life, Moses says. Peter says, make every effort to add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. Because we cannot live the truth if we do not know the truth, if we are not familiar with the source of truth. And that's why Moses commanded them to write the law wherever there was a space big enough to write it. He wanted it everywhere that he could think of so that they would become familiar with it, so that they would know it and understand it. And only then could they be confident that they could live it. Peter calls us to the same task. He 
goes on to say, if we neglect this task of adding to our faith, we're short-sighted and blind. The words of Moses and Peter in their challenge, their parting challenges to their particular congregations are vital instruction for God's people at any time. But I think it's especially vital instruction for us at this time. We've been talking over really the past year about um, the circumstances that we find ourselves in, and I don't need to rehearse them again for you. You know very well the things that we're facing. We've enjoyed a season as Americans of relative peace and prosperity, and boy, what a blessing that has been. But as we look around us, it should be evident that that time of peace is coming to an end. Forces opposed to God are rising up and becoming increasingly bold in their antagonism to God and to his people. And in the past year, that pace has accelerated. We see almost on a weekly basis evidence of the social upheaval that's taking place. It is time for us to become warriors. It's time for us to become warriors. We have lived in peace, and there is a time for peace, but there is also a time for war. I'm not talking about being warriors in a political battle, though there certainly is a political element to all of this. And I'm not talking even about becoming warriors in the moral battles that we have been fighting, trying to preserve the moral fiber of our nation, because we know that once that is lost, there is a slide on a downward slope that perhaps cannot be reversed. And all of those things are important. But this is a battle, Paul says, not against flesh and blood but against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil. Therefore, Paul says, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand firm. And like Moses and Peter, the first piece of spiritual armor that Paul lists as vital equipment for this battle is the belt of truth. A few years ago, Sharon and I had the opportunity to visit Gettysburg. Uh, actually, we had been there a couple of years before, and then we went again, this time for a week-long leadership retreat. And um, no pun intended there, thinking about war and retreat. This wasn't a retreat of leadership, but a retreat for leadership. We walked the battlefields, and uh, we had um, uh, an, a teacher with us who had studied the Civil War extensively and, and knew um, particularly the Battle of Gettysburg. And as you know from history, uh, one of the most significant battles uh, of the Civil War, and many, many lives were lost. We had an opportunity to um, uh, retrace the steps of Pickett's charge across the field um, and uh, um, over a mile across open ground. And imagine the rain of bullets and shrapnel that were coming down on those soldiers as they marched across that field. In fact, uh, in, in the museum, they talked about um, after the battle was over, they retrieved a, a, a length of uh, split rail fence, you know, that cedar split rail about, I don't know, six or seven feet long, and they counted over 100 bullet holes in that one piece of fence. 
Imagine the soldiers facing that kind of an onslaught. A battlefield like that was full of thousands of men. Smoke in the air, the deafening sound of gunfire and cannon fire, dead and injured soldiers laying on the ground, having to watch your step as you try to step over them, and then engaging in hand-to-hand combat. And as we stood there on the battlefield and just kind of allowed those realities to sink in, you can just see how easy it can be in the heat of battle to get disoriented, to get separated from your regiment and confused about where you're supposed to be and what you're supposed to do. And you can imagine how you could find yourself fighting with all of your might, but actually at cross purposes with the objective of the battle. Because you're fighting here when you should be fighting there, and in the midst of the confusion, you don't realize it, and you're advancing in one direction when you should be advancing in a different direction. And that's why flags were so important in the Civil War and in other wars like that. Because the battlefield was too loud and confused for bugle commands and the voice of your commander to even be heard. And so soldiers were trained to keep their eyes on the flag, to follow it, and to orient themselves to it. It's for that reason that uh, men would sacrifice their lives to defend the flag. And there are all kinds of stories of acts of heroism in the Battle of Gettysburg as men stepped up when one carrying the flag would fall, the next would step up, and of course they would become the target then. But they were committed. It was their duty and their honor to carry the flag. And as they prepared for battle, they would practice with the flag so that every soldier knew his flag. And in the thick of the battle, they could recognize it and they could rally to it and they could orient themselves and know where they were supposed to be and what they were supposed to do. And in the same way, God's word is that important to us as we engage in this battle that we find ourselves in. Moses essentially said, if you want to be warriors, you've got to plaster God's word all over your lives. And Peter said, if you want to keep from being ineffective and unfruitful, make every effort to add knowledge to your faith, as well as other things. And Paul said, if you want to be equipped for the battle against the cosmic forces of evil, put on the belt of truth. Just as it was vital for a soldier to know their flag and remain oriented to it in the heat of battle, it is vital for us as God's people to know the word. Seems kind of basic, doesn't it? The thing of it is that we tend to neglect the basic things. The thing that's the hardest thing for me to eat is my vegetables. It's basic, but I still struggle with it. The fact of it is that over the past four or five decades, really, the church in America has been in a crisis of knowledge. We have neglected God's word and the study of God's word. And I can't help but think that that neglect and that lack of familiarity with the word of God has contributed to the difficulties that we're facing, to know how to respond to the crisis and the circumstances that we're in. God said through the prophet Hosea in Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6, he said, for lack of knowledge, my people perish. And he was, of course, indicting the priests 
for their failure to teach the people the word of God. That is why I am committed as your pastor to teach the word and that the word needs to be our guide and our authority. As we close, I want to just share several ways, just three ways that the word is a vital resource for us in the thick of battle. First of all, it is our authority for what is true and what is right. The cultural landscape is constantly changing, and people's opinions about what is true and right are changing all the time. And it can be tempting to adopt the cultural consensus about what is good, what is true. But the cultural consensus cannot be our guide. It is no guide at all. It is the blind leading the blind. We've been studying in um, the Gospel of John in Sunday school, and we talked about it today, that John says that Jesus is the true light that brings light, the light of truth to all men. There is a source of truth. There is a place where we can find truth that does not change, that does not come and go with the fads of culture. It is his word. I want to read uh, the, the, the ladies um, in their last Bible study that they concluded in the spring were working their way through Psalm 119. I'm going to read Psalm 119 to you now which if you know Psalm 119, if you know the word, would know that it would take about half an hour to do it. So I'm not actually going to do that. I'm going to read one section, beginning in verse 9. How can a man, how can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you, Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth, all the statutes, decrees of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways, like a soldier fixing their eyes on the flag. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. God's word is an authority to help us maintain our bearings in a world where truth is always changing and is not truth at all. Secondly, the word serves as our marching orders. It establishes our priorities and it gives us direction so that we are fighting for the right things and we are fighting in the right direction. And because of that, it's essential that we follow it even when it seems impractical. And that's the challenge. So often, I find this true of myself, and people wrestle with this, I think. We're willing to follow the word as long as we agree with it. (laughs) But when the word departs from our inclinations, we are tempted to follow our inclinations instead of the word. Can you see how devastating that can be on a battlefield? If every soldier decides in the thick of the battle, in the midst of the confusion, well, I know the flag's over there. I know the command says go this way, but it seems better over here. When it doesn't seem to make sense or when it seems counterproductive, we easily 
abandon the word for our own way and our own strategies. And before long, we find ourselves fighting battles that we were never commanded to fight. So it's vital, not only that we know the word, but that we do what it says, that we trust our marching orders and follow them, no matter how ludicrous they may seem. And they do seem ludicrous at times. What do you mean, love your enemy? (laughs) That's crazy. No matter how tempting it may be to launch out on our own, we have to follow the word. The word is our marching orders. Finally, the word is intended to point beyond itself. Peter and Paul and Moses call us to know the word and to study the word. But what they understand is that in studying the word, their desire is that we discover something more than the word. That we discover the one who gave us the word. The word is intended to point beyond itself so that we would come to know God and learn his character so that we would come to value what he values and think as he thinks and know how to respond because our responses have been trained after him. Let us not be content to know just the word and what it says, but let us seek here to find the word, the living God. Then we will be prepared for the battles that we face to be the warriors that God is calling us to be. So let us hear those words and the urgency of Moses' appeal again. Take to heart all the words that I have solemnly declared to you this day. They are not just idle words for you. They are your life. Let us be students of the word not just to know what it says, but to know the God who said it, and then to do what it says. Amen.